My best friend growing up, my first best friend, uh, was my cousin Michael. And we both lived in Lakewood. He lived on Atkins right off Madison. I lived on Riverway just a couple jagged blocks away. And we would walk or ride our bikes back and forth. He would sleep at my house. I would sleep at his house. Um, and we spent an enormous amount of time together, uh, really right up until high school, probably. Um, my mom is one of seven children, uh, and those seven McConville children uh, had a total of 22 kids. So Mike and I were just two of, of 22 cousins. And our grandparents, Helen and Bob McConville, um, they spoiled us. They, uh, years and years ago, it's been decades now, but they used to have property in Western New York, uh, in Chautauqua, that we all called the farm. Um, it wasn't a farm, really, because um, we really didn't grow anything. Grandpa eventually had a blueberry patch. Um, but there were no animals or anything like that. It was, it was really... It was more of a retreat uh, for our entire family. So people would spend weeks at a time uh, in Chautauqua on the farm. Um, different family members at different times and oftentimes we overlapped. Uh, the Giffords and McDonald's and uh, McLean's and Bowman's and us and Mike's family, uh, the McConville's. Um, the first time I've ever heard about a Shakespearean green world was in college and the way the professor described it to me was uh, sometimes in Shakespeare's plays whether it's Winter's Tale or um, Midsummer's Night Dream or even uh, Hamlet and King Lear um, sometimes Shakespeare will send his characters away to a distant land to a forest or uh, a sort of magical fairy land. And again, sometimes it could be a wooded area, sometimes it was oceanic, but when those characters would go away to the forest or the, the, the green world, they would go there to escape the real world. That's the first time I heard of this. Um, Chautauqua has always been in in so many ways in my mind, it's, it still is my green world. Um, but the person who coined that phrase, uh, his name's Northrop Fry, he explained green world in that um, these places where magic can happen, where people can transform, where people can learn things that they normally wouldn't know, um, that's not an escape from reality. Nature is reality. We're, we're getting back to it, which is why so much possibility in learning can happen. And so anyway, um, Mike and I, we learned so much at Chautauqua. Uh, we learned to hunt. We went with Grandpa a few times. We never shot anything. We were very unsuccessful hunters. Um, we uh, learned to fish, learned to water ski on Lake Chautauqua. Uh, Chautauqua's lake looks like a bag uh, tied off in the middle. And actually, Chautauqua was an Iroquois word uh, for bag tied in the middle. But it also means uh, two moccasins tied together. Mike and I were tied together uh, through most of our childhood. Like I said, my first best friend. Uh, and there's one particular day that stands out uh, more than any other that I f think about uh, frequently. Um, and it's the reason this day that um, I didn't eat pasta um, for a good 15 years. Uh, and it's the reason that even today, uh, I hate amusement parks. I know people around here love Cedar Point that's only 40 minutes away. Uh, I detest it. It's, there's nothing amusement, amusing about it at all. Um, so anyway, this particular day, uh, through the magic of Google, I discovered that it, it was probably mid-July, around July 16th, 1983. I was 10, Mike was 9. You can Google the weather at any point in recent history now, which is absolutely astounding. But anyway, um, and there was a heat wave going through Chautauqua. I had been up there all week with Uncle Bobby, Aunt Gina, and the rest of Mike's family, my family here home in Cleveland. 
And this particular day, uh, Mike and I didn't have anything special to do. Uh, so we decided we were going to fish all day at Grandpa Stock Pond, stocked with bass and bluegill and some catfish and sunfish. Uh, we were going to fish there all day. Uh, so Uncle Bobby, the night before, had gone to Hogan's Hut and he got us a, a styrofoam container of night crawlers. Uh, so once Mike and I got our stuff together, uh, got the tackle and the fishing rods, uh, we went down to the pond. Um, no doubt Uncle Bobby probably helped us uh, set up but we were old enough at that time to be left alone by the pond. It was so hot. The humidity from the day in, in the early morning was just draped like a blanket uh, over the pond and over the, the fields that surrounded the farm. And even as the day wore on, the, the normally chirpy uh, red-winged blackbirds among the cattails were quiet. Um, the, the daytime crickets now and then let out their own chirps, um, but it was such this oppressive heat. Uh, yet Mike and I, for some reason, decided we were going to stay there all day. We we're going to hang out on the boulders, try and catch fish, uh, maybe lounge under the willows. I don't remember eating lunch that day, but there's no doubt Aunt Gina probably sent us um, with some peanut butter and jellies that were soggy by the time we ate them because of the humidity and just how oppressively hot it was. As the day wore on though, um, toward evening, the uh, farmhouse was maybe a quarter mile from where we were on the far side of the pond and Aunt Gina rang uh, the dinner bell, actually on the, on the back porch of the yellow farmhouse. There was one of those iron triangles and she gave it a good what for, and we could hear it down by the pond, and Uncle Bobby helped us scoop up our, our tackle and our fishing lines that didn't get any use through the day. The fish weren't biting at all. Took the styrofoam container and emptied the worms into the pond for the fish, free dinner. Uh, and then we started the hike back up to the farmhouse. Um, walked around uh, to the bridge, bridge just wide enough for ATVs to fit over. Um, some people through the years drove off that bridge. Um, you come around the back of the log cabin past the cra two crab apple trees in front of the cabin. Then on the left, you see the flagpole that always had an American flag. I recall sometimes there was a Marine Corps flag there, uh, sometimes an Irish flag past the pile of rocks that held fossils that Mike and I and my other cousins collected from the creek. Um, up the hill, the hill was steep enough that we could sled and toboggan down it in the winter time. And the 4th of July, my uncles, uh, Dave and Brad and Paul, they always got fireworks. Uh, and the hill was a, a perfect launch point to send them off over the distant fields. And, uh, all the, the, the friends from Chautauqua, the Rice family and everyone always came and oohed and odd at the, at the fireworks. But anyway, there's a, there's a big sycamore atop this tree and not too far past that was the yellow farmhouse with the back deck. And I remember the three of us, Uncle Bobby, Mike and I, walking up that deck, sliding open the screen door, no air conditioning, and as you walk in, you're in the dining room and the, the dining room table is right there and it's lengthwise. So we actually, you walk in behind the head of the table and I remember the table. I don't remember many sounds, but um, certainly my other cousins were there, Matthew and Shannon. Um, but I remember the table just completely full of this steaming dinner that Aunt Gina had prepared. She was a great cook and I remember a big bowl of, of meatballs and then another big pasta dish, this mountain of just the steaming and smoking uh, spaghetti noodles, and a big bowl of marinara and garlic bread with fresh basil uh, and salad. Didn't eat salad, still don't eat salad. Probably a bottle of wine. Uh, Aunt Gina told Mike and I, go wash your hands, come back and we'll eat. So we did and Dinner was quiet, other than the sound of the cutlery hitting the, the, uh, the plates and the bowls. Uh, I didn't think after a day that hot that I'd eat much. And 
I was always a skinny little thing, very picky eater, who didn't eat much. Uh, but we scarfed. I had to have three or four uh, big helpings of pasta uh, and just scarf the marinara in meatballs and uh, garlic bread. And um, no one said much through the whole thing. Well, finally, 20 minutes later, 25 minutes later, uh, we all leaned back. Uncle Bobby patted his belly and he turned to Michael and I and said, boys, why don't you go get go get new t-shirts on and Gene and I have a surprise for you. We're going to go to the Jamestown Fair once we get all this cleaned up. So let us do the dishes. You get cleaned up. Go play outside. Then we'll head to the fair. So Mike and I did. And we went outside uh, around the barn, no doubt. And behind the barn was a 55 gallon burn barrel. Next to that was the, the goat house. We never had goats, but it was a low slung goat house where the back of the roof was so low you could climb up on it and lay there and survey the whole farm, the blueberry patch and the pine trees and just start to see down that hill. And Mike and I played, most likely lounged because we were so full. Eventually Aunt Gina and Uncle Bobby and the little ones came out uh, and we piled in their station wagons, one of those big family uh, station wagons with the fake wood stickers on them. Uh, Michael and I claimed the third seat that faced backwards and the rear window rolled down. Um, and we all piled in and started the slow drive uh, to Jamestown. Mike and I love taking drives with Uncle Bobby. Um, at the time, there was a, a newer song out. It's a song called uh, Shut Up Your Face by... I think it's Joel Dolce, Dolce. Um, but it was, it's a sort of call and refrain song. Um, what's the matter you? Hey. So Uncle Bobby would always sing the parts where he's questioning and Mike and I would then chime in with a, what's the matter you? Hey, why you feel so sad? Hey, it's a not so bad. Hey, and then everyone together, shut up your face. So anyway, no doubt, we sang this song as we're going up and down these country roads, down Stowe Ferry, up the giant hill, cross over Morley Road, uh, head all the way down Stowe Ferry Road toward Hogan's Hut, and then veer east on 394. And as you wind up and down 394 next to Lake Chautauqua, you catch these beautiful glimpses of the lake uh, in the distance. And Mike and I the whole time are hanging over the tailgate, taking in the dust, just this beautiful hot evening in Western New York. We arrive at the fair and um, finally get parked and Uncle Bobby turns to Michael and says, what do you want to do first? And Mike points at this, there's this big arc of neon lights, orange and purple neon lights, almost Halloween uh, looking. And he points to that and his eyes just glow up in this, this, this golden excitement. Uh, and he says, we're doing that first. Michael and I, being the oldest, were the only ones who could, and the, and the tallest of, of the cousins, were the only ones who could ride at the time. Uh, so we walk over, get through the roped off line, and uh, we get in this contraption, and it has, an, it has an arm, and then like bike spokes jutting out from the center hub these bike spokes. And at the end of each bike spoke is a little silver rocket with a steel grate on the side that opens up to let the passengers in and closes. And there's these little rocket ships then around the entire bike wheel. And the three of us pile in, Uncle Bobby first, and then I sit between his legs. And then Mike sits in front of me and we get one big seatbelt around us. So we're almost like this little train sitting there and Michael's head is right here and my uncle Bobby is right behind me so he can look down on my head and this thing starts spinning around and around and accelerating accelerating faster and I've always been motion sick always the few plane rides that we took um when we were fortunate to travel as a family, I always got sick that night. 
Um, I always felt like I was going up and down. And I've always hated amusement parks. This wasn't the first time that I would hated a ride that I was on. Uh, Cedar Point is only 40 minutes from here and I know people love it and adore it and great love it and adore it. I find nothing amusing about amusement parks. As my kids were growing up, my wife was the one to take them and I stayed home and did whatever I wanted because I hate amusement parks that much. Uh, when, um, I think maybe just a year before that, uh, my parents took us to Disney World and I didn't know that Space Mountain uh, was a roller coaster. If I had, I wouldn't have gone in. And I, I even seem to remember there, us getting in the roped off lines at Space Mountain and turning to my parents and going, what is going on here? What, what's this noise and this screaming? And getting from my parents and my older sister like, hey, shut up, nerd. Enjoy space. This is not a roller coaster. You're fine. Well, it is a roller coaster. And I remember dad throwing us in the front seat, Jeannie and I in the front seat of this roller coaster and him getting behind us. Well, in Space Mountain, it's dark and there's strobe lights. And if you're motion sick, that's not great. And it doesn't help either if your dad is sitting in the seat behind you screaming, oh my God, there's no track in front of us, we're going to die. So anyway, Mike and Uncle Bobby and I are on this machine of death spinning around in this circle, and I'm starting to not feel so good. Remember three, four helpings of pasta and the heat, and as we're spinning, we're picking up the smells of the funnel cakes and the hot dogs and the sound of the beeping cars, and it's just this sensory overload, and we're spinning and spinning and spinning, and then all of a sudden, this arm, this monstrosity that was no doubt crafted in hell by Satan himself, starts lifting up in the air slowly until it's completely vertical and it's spinning around and around. And Mike is pressed against my stomach. I'm pressed against Uncle Bobby's stomach. And I am like a tube of toothpaste being squeezed slowly. And I am really not feeling so good. I turn over my shoulder as we're looping around. And I scream to Uncle Bobby, I don't feel so good. And it's at that point that I received maybe the worst advice I've ever received in my life. I love my Uncle Bobby, but this might be the worst advice I ever received. He yells, just burp a little. What? came out of my mouth when I tried to burp a little. Mike's head was right here. And it was like he was wearing these dripping dreadlocks of pasta and he's shouting, stop it, because it's sliding down his t-shirt. And, it, you know, inside that, it's this fake bright red sparkly vinyl. And you can hear the, the noodles just slapping the vinyl and going flying out the steel grates. And I look back and I can't stop. It was one of those, once you get started, it's everything is coming out. And I turn and look and Uncle Bobby has this smear of marinara across his cheek and like a noodle eking its way into the corner of his mouth. And he's yelling for me to stop and I can't stop. And we're flying around and it's everywhere and time just stopped this this thing kept going and i just i i kept praying for it to go back down and eventually it did and started slowing well this is a county fair so it's not the slickest operation so there's a deck um that they could only load and unload half the occupants at a time. And of course, we were on the far side. So we had to sit there for a few minutes, covered and try and wipe ourselves. And I'm still throwing up and Mike's moved away from me and it's down his back and in his shorts. And I mean, we look like real life Jackson Pollock paintings. Only it wasn't paint. It was pasta and little pieces of basil and 
Do you know what spaghetti smells like when it's regurgitated? We had to sit there and it was awful and I was crying. And so they finally spin us around and I'll never forget the guy who was unloading us. He was this tall, skinny guy in this um, uh, sleeveless t-shirt and he goes to, to touch the gate to unlock it and his hand flies back and that's the first time I've ever heard such a creative and long and prolific uh, string of curse words. He just let it fly. And he unlocks it, walks over, and grabs the bucket and a mop. Any ride that needs to have a bucket and a mop nearby is reason enough to hate amusement parks. And we got out and Uncle Bobby stripped off our t-shirts and just threw them. And Gina and Uncle Bobby debated whether to buy us new shirts at the fair or not. Uh, they didn't. Uncle Bobby took his t-shirt off, wiped himself down, and that was it. I ruined our, our great night at the fair. The, the beautiful oranges and pinks of the sunset were, were in the sky, and we were going back home to the farm. And Mike and I again reclaimed the third seat, and I hung out up and down those roads, just sort of dry heaving the whole time. I had nothing left in me. Maybe some spit down that tailgate and onto Morley Road as we crossed it and went back home. Mike, um, Mike passed away in January 2016, just shy of his 41st birthday, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I think of this, or hunting crayfish with him in the creek, uh, often. Um, we, uh, as we got into high school and became adults and started our own family, we, we lost touch. And us cousins lost touch. Um, we're busy, justifiably so. But um, I, I miss him. I miss Mike frequently. And what what carries me forward, these, these fun and gross memories, is that when I think about them, um, and I think about Chautauqua and that escape and family and Springsteen on the radio, all these memories, um, they're, they're just a tremendous, tremendous blessing. <laughs>